Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. In South Korea, child rearing still remains first and foremost the responsibility of mothers. Pressures from society, and frequently their own families, create expectations as to what children ought to do, eat, and learn. In opposition to these social constraints, mothers employ different strategies and rationales to give their children the best life possible. To learn more about how women steer the childhood and aspirations of their offspring, as well as their own self-development, we had the pleasure of interviewing Professor Bonnie Tilland. We discussed the relations women maintain across generations, with their parents and parents-in-law, but also with their own children, how women contest the narrative of national strength and other social constructs through their own mothering, and how they conceive the future of their children as they grow up. Bunny Tilland is professor at the East Asia International College of Yonsei University's Wonju campus. She obtained her PhD in social cultural anthropology from the University of Washington. She also completed a graduate certificate in feminist studies and a master's in international studies, Korea studies, from the same institution, as well as a BA in East Asian languages and culture from Lawrence University. Professor Bunny Tilland, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. What sparked your interest in Korea, and especially in Korean families? Well, um, I didn't have a very direct route to studying either Korea or Korean families. I, I grew up in the Seattle area on a small island, and I can say it was a very white place. Not a lot of Asians around in that, in that area, but I started going to high school in Seattle, and at that time there were a lot of Japanese exchange students, and then a lot of Korean students as well. So, um, and then I also kind of, still living on the island at the time, I noticed pretty much the only people who were not white at that time, I shouldn't say the only, but there were not many, the only others were Korean adoptees at that time. In the U.S., there were a lot of children adopted from Korea. And so as a child, even, I remember thinking, I, I would ask, so how did they get here, right? And so it was kind of a taboo question. People would say, well, you know, they're born in Korea, but they were adopted here, and so let's not worry about it anymore. That's, that's just how... This is how it is. But even then, I was curious sort of not just in how they were doing in the U.S. And, and sort of with that difference, especially in such a white place. But I was actually really curious even then. I studied a lot of maps when I was a kid, and so I was just wondering, how did it happen that kids from this particular place ended up in this other particular place? And so I guess I was interested starting from that time, especially in issues of Korean adoption, on the Korean end and then um, on the U.S. end as well. And so when I started doing my master's work, um, I studied Chinese literature as an undergraduate, and then I started doing master's work in Korean studies. Uh, I'd been living in Japan for a while, in China for a while, and so I took a few trips to Korea and then kind of fell in love with the place. I started out doing my master's work really specifically interested in Korean adoption as it pertained to Korean family issues, but then I sort of sort of branched out. Um, I, I became more interested in all of the different stresses that work upon the Korean family, um, all different kinds of Korean families of all different kinds of economic classes. And so I started out doing my PhD research on um, basically on kind of women's life stories about how they navigate those difficulties, um, how they see family life as having changed, how they see family values as having changed, and how their own place in the family um, is affected by those changes. Our interview today will focus on how women use senses to pursue their own development as well as that of their families. But before going any further, why did you decide to focus on sensory experiences and what exactly do you mean with that? When I started my dissertation fieldwork, I was setting out to do kind of a long period of fieldwork. I was basically doing 18 months and then I, I still did a little bit more, so you can say I was doing field work for about two years. And when I started out, I had these very broad questions, sort of how has family life changed um, in your lifetime? Like if you compare the ways that the things your parents did, especially the things your mother did when, they, when she was raising you in terms of discipline or in terms of the affection she showed to you, how is that different from the ways that you raise your own kids? So I had these kind of pretty broad questions. I'm also talking about the way that family values impacted that. So like in terms of, you know, people always talk about Confucianism when you talk about Korea, but even just sort of talking about these really broad topics with women. As I started interviewing women, I had a pretty small group. Anthropologists often have a sample size, if you will, that would make sociologists very uneasy. It's not like a large number of people. It's often uh, kind of a handful of people that you're interviewing very intensively, 
quite often for a long period of time. So I really had, in the dissertation itself, I really had like 12 women of different ages, between 30 and 50, who I was following up with every week. But then I had more people, and uh, twice as many again, who I was meeting quite often, and then more people I was interviewing kind of one-off. And so as I started interviewing about these issues of family, these very broad questions, right when I started my research, I noticed people talked about TV dramas quite a lot. And it was kind of an interest of mine, too. At that time, Hallyu and the Korean wave was a pretty hot topic in Western Korean studies. And so I was kind of following the ways they talked about the mainstream dominant images they saw of Korean families on screen and how it related to their own life or how it did not relate to their own life. But then as I continued interviewing, of course, I, had, I wasn't setting up my interviews to only interview women who were fans of watching dramas or um, these kind of rabid fans or avid fans of dramas. So I had some that watched and some that didn't. But then I noticed that people, when I went back and was analyzing my interviews, I noticed people were talking a lot more, not just about seeing things on screen or sort of relating this visual media to their own life, but they were really talking a lot about all these different senses. So senses really in the very basic sense of the five senses. So, so sight and sound and touch and smell and taste. And using these different senses to talk about their hardships and also their sort of rewards of mothering in particular. So I started really trying to investigate the ways that they used language of the senses to discuss daily struggles or, like I said, daily rewards of parenting. And specifically, I was interested in in the ways this language popped up as kind of a, a way to talk back to state discourses or social pressures. So especially like in, in one of my chapters, I talk about the way women, especially in their 30s, talked a lot about the importance of touch, of really intensive sort of mother's touch on children, um, sort of in terms of their sensory development, in terms of their psychological well-being. And people would say, well, if I had, you know, another child or if I had two more children, as the state is telling me to do to improve Korea's low birth rate, I wouldn't have all of that sensory investment that I could make because I wouldn't have enough of me to go around. So kind of using the senses, I don't want to say that they were sort of necessarily strategically using the senses, but they were thinking about the senses as a way of uh, making sense of their own parenting decisions. Childbirth doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes place in a specific context, and there are already people involved that are not the parents themselves. A big figure in this is the mother-in-law. In Many cultures, the relationship between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law might seem difficult. And you wrote that the historically fraught relationship between daughter-in-law and mother-in-law remains emotionally loaded despite South Korea's recent shift to nuclear family living structures. Why does this relationship remain so conflictual in Korea? I I started out my research um, asking these questions, um, these questions of how family life has changed and how family values have changed. And women talked to me about that moment when they became a mother. They talked about the birth itself. They had stories about the first few days being a mother. And they had a lot of very, um, like very ambivalent stories about mothers-in-law, as well as their own mothers. I shouldn't, like many of them also sort of compared the mother and the mother-in-law and sort of the way that they felt supported or not by both of these women in their lives. Because, of course, when I actually, when I first started doing field work, of course, my, my Korean language skills, uh, there's always room for improvement in one's Korean language skills. So I was really confused at first because, of course, you would just call it both people your omoni. And so I, I would get confused and they would be talking about one mother and then another mother. And finally, they'd be clarifying there's the mother-in-law, the shi omoni, and then there's the chin omoni, the, the, my actual mother. So, but it was almost like these, in terms of the um, support that both of these women were supposed to give, as long as both of these women were still alive and nearby, um, it was almost like they were interchangeable in certain ways. But then when it came to stories women told about how supported they felt or the stresses they felt, there were a lot of stories about mothers-in-law and the same kind of stories you see in Korean TV dramas, um, the same kind of stories you see sort of in Korean folk tales or fairy tales. There's some really evil stories of uh, mothers-in-law. Uh, often, rather than just being a story of, of a, a mother-in-law being really mean or difficult or evil, they were just very ambivalent stories. Especially there were a, a women um, who were in their 30s and 40s, I'd say 40s especially, because I was interviewing women who were between the ages of 30 and 50. 
they were expressing a lot of stress over the fact that the media, as they said, was telling them that now they could have a friendly relationship with their mother-in-law, that now that patriarchal society was crumbling, um, um, there should be room for more of a friendly relationship between a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law. And so the women said, some of the women I, I talked to said that they felt this actually gave them even more pressure. They were supposed to have this kind of friendly relationship, and yet they still felt watched by mothers-in-law. They still felt judged by mothers-in-law. And a lot of these women were not even, they weren't living with their mothers-in-law. Unlike previous generations, they weren't actually expected to be waiting hand and foot on mothers-in-law or, or living in the same space. Although one of my interviewees was actually living with her mother-in-law and had a lot of very stressful stories about that. But even though they were not living with mothers-in-law, they still felt a lot of pressure with mothers-in-law dropping by anytime without any notice or just having a lot of expectations, especially about how they were supposed to be raising up the grandkids in terms of education or in terms of teaching manners or all of these kind of, even just down to the kind of foods that they were giving. Often they said, the women would say that they felt that they did get a lot of help from mothers-in-law in terms of child care or in, t- in terms of just sort of general support, but then they also felt quite ambivalent about the relationship and got a lot of stress about it. But as I was writing um, writing through this material and analyzing the interviews, I also noticed another interesting thing is that this relationship of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law actually kind of became a conduit to talk about all these other relationships as well. So when I was actually analyzing interviews, women would say, oh, let me tell you a story about my mother-in-law. And I was doing a lot of group interviews and everybody would get started talking about their mothers-in-law. And then, but after a little while of listening, I'd realized they were not even talking about mothers-in-law anymore. They were talking about some particularly sort of patriarchal, domineering father-in-law, or they were talking about the stressful relationship with a sister-in-law. So sometimes it wasn't even really about the mother-in-law, but it was just that that relationship was sort of, sort of anchored down everything else. It was sort of the most historically, emotionally fraught relationship, and so it then provided a way for women to talk about all of these other difficult family relationships they had to navigate, especially with in-laws, but even with other sort of natal family members as well. You just mentioned that mother-in-laws were used as a way to talk about other issues, but by focusing on mother-in-law, isn't it restricting venues for change only to the mother-in-law itself and actually preventing a real discussion, real change for other parts of the patriarchal structure? I do think the fact that the mother-in-law became sort of the central core device of a lot of people's, a lot of these women's discussions, it could have some limiting effects in focusing just on the mother-in-law. A lot of these other relationships, they, even though they came out in conversation, they didn't always, you could say they might not really get fully addressed. And sort of a few of my interviewees really focused on their frustrations with, they would say, the weakness of their mother-in-law, whether it was sort of their physical weakness or a combination of their physical and, and uh, emotional weakness that they couldn't stand up to their domineering husbands. Um, who were also giving the daughters-in-law stress as well. So uh, things would kind of get expressed as frustration towards mothers-in-law when in fact there was a lot of anger there about the way the fathers-in-law were interfering in their daughters-in-law's lives or their whole family's lives. And so you could say that it could be kind of, it could be limiting in the sense that it, it really doesn't get at that patriarchy that still exists and it doesn't really break open all of these family relationships. But on the other hand, um, one other thing I talk about in this particular part of the dissertation is, um, is the whole um, visual culture aspect. I'm focusing on one particular drama in this chapter looking at um, a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relationship in the drama and the ways that a lot of the women that I interviewed really love this particular drama. This was a drama that was by Kim Soo-hyun, uh, In Sengun Autumn Tawa, Life is Beautiful, um, from a few years back. And so they were really focusing, kind of obsessively watching this drama, focusing on the mother and daughter relationship, and then also thinking from there about the relationship with the, the mother figure in the drama with her adult son. And so I think... Sometimes using this mother-in-law, at least discursively, at least talking about the mother-in-law in these sort of group complaining sessions, of which I often just felt I was sort of a bystander, they would have continued complaining and talking about them even if I hadn't been there. But I think it, it does provide a certain kind of cathartic venue to talk about issues with the whole family, even if the mother-in-law is used perhaps unfairly as, as the core focal point.
Well, when you read sort of the anthropological literature that talks about this relationship and sort of Korean kinship, especially if you look at a lot of the things published at sort of the height of kinship studies in anthropology, if you look at work from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, you have a lot of stories of daughters-in-law getting married and moving in with their parents-in-law and all of the stresses they have sort of basically waiting on their mother-in-law and having to take all of her orders really being um, completely bound by her ideas about what raising children should be once the daughters in law then have children of their own. And so there was this very close and tense relationship and a lot of pressure also um, thinking about pressures to have a son, to continue the family line, those kind of stresses too. But as I was looking into why this relationship remains so conflicted, even though, as I said, most women, at least most women in cities, um, are not living with their parents-in-law anymore. And so, as I mentioned, I I think one thing which creates stress is sort of now that you're not living with parents-in-law, there is a certain sort of unexpected quality to it. Like, if you're living with them, you know they're going to be there, and you're going to have to pay attention to them and address their needs. But um, if they're not living with you, but they live just in the next apartment over or next apartment block over or a short drive away, then they could just drop by any time and demand that you feed them and ask why you're not giving um, their grandchildren full cooked breakfast while you're not teaching your children Confucian classics. That was one thing that my um, one of my interviews said that her father-in-law would call her up and demand at seven in the morning, be asking about how many Chinese characters her kids knew at that point. You know, so you don't have someone living with you, but you still have this, the possibility that they'll make demands at any time. And so that's why some of the people that I interviewed who had parents-in-law who lived in other cities, or even in some rare cases who had moved to another country, expressed a lot of satisfaction with with that arrangement. That they felt like that distance actually made their relationship stronger. They almost said that they felt like their mothers-in-law also saw it as sort of an obligation. They would have to constantly check in. Then they would have to, in turn, report on their activities to their mothers-in-law. So it was kind of like this obligation that both sides felt, even though maybe neither side really wanted to have that kind of constant daily check-in or that kind of close relationship. It was just many said that they felt that was the expectation. That's what a Korean family should be. They should be close and they should be calling and checking in or dropping by all the time. In practice, what ideal is a daughter-in-law expected to live up to in order to satisfy the expectations of a mother-in-law? Well, I, I do want to definitely acknowledge that there's a ton of variation in Korean families, and so probably as much variation as any, any other place about what actually happens in practice in families. But I think for the people I, I talked to, uh, I should also just quickly mention that women I were, was interviewing were in the, the city of Jeonju in Cholabukdo down in the south. So I wanted to do research in a smaller provincial city instead of in Seoul. The answers I would have gotten in Seoul could have been a little bit different as well. But something that women talked a lot about was, I guess the two things women talked the most about in terms of feeling pressure, in terms of being that ideal daughter-in-law, were food. Food was a really big one that they felt like they couldn't just serve their husband, um, the son of their parents-in-law, just uh, some toast for breakfast. They felt like they had the responsibility to have the full meal all ready to go, even if that's not what their husband wanted. And even if it's not what they wanted, they felt like there was this pressure to do that. And also, of course, to feed their kids or their parents-in-law's grandkids. A nutritious, full, sort of Korean, a varied Korean diet. Um, So they talked about that as being something which um, would sort of make you an ideal daughter-in-law or not. And then education was the other one. The pressure to really um, stay on top of all of the um, changes in the education system, um, new different kinds of um, preparations one should be doing for the university entrance exam, um, the kind of hagwon that you should be sending your children to. And so, and this, was, this is something that researchers have looked at in the case of Korea is, as being an expectation of mothers, but something that their own mothers or their own mothers-in-law didn't really have to do because the education system has changed so much. Um, and so now there's been a shift from just sort of the mother who was supposed to be there for her children and be there for the family to this whole figure of the education mother, the education manager mother, who um, should be on top of all of the changes in the curriculum, should be on top of the kind of hagwan you should be sending your kid to now in order for them to succeed. So they felt this kind of pressure from their parents-in-law to really stay on top of all of these changes and the education trends, basically. And so the way they described that, they said that was basically a full-time job. So Of the women I interviewed, about half of them were actually staying at home 
and the other, other half were working. And so, but whether they were working or staying at home, they said managing the education of their children felt like a full-time job, that they had to they had to always be doing research and talking to other mothers about what they should be doing, um, where they should be sending their kids. They also felt that pressure from their parents-in-law, especially mothers-in-law, even though they expressed frustration that their mothers-in-law didn't really understand the educational landscape, but still put the pressure on them to understand it and to constantly research it. Let's move to another relationship within the family, that between mother and baby. You argue that of all the senses, the sense of touch is one of the most frequently singled out for its special role in the children's sensory development. Why do you mean by sensory development first? And why is touch so important for those women? Um, when I was doing my um, interviews and, and going around to different community centers and talking to women, especially mothers that way, I started noticing all of these classes that were offered in community centers. Down in Jeju, there's all of these cultural centers, Munhua Egypt, maybe more than in some other cities. And then also sort of the big stores, Home Plus or I believe E-Mart, they have these cultural centers in the basement. And so a lot of people will send their kids to these classes or they have sort of self-development classes um, that mostly women will attend or they have classes for parents and children together. So I started noticing just sort of this abundance of sensory education. So especially five senses development so Oga and Pardar Kyoyuk. And so I started kind of honing in on that because it was something that my interviewees, um, even who didn't attend these kind of classes, actually focused on a lot. Women I talked to who had very young children. Maybe they had young children and they were about to have another baby as well. Kids that were just preschool age, two or three, or just infants. Um, they talked a lot about how in order to raise not only a smart kid, but also a psychologically stable psychologically, emotionally stable kid. It was really important to give the proper kinds of touch, sort of show love and show support through touch to children. And so this, I mean, this isn't some crazy Korean thing. This is something that any anyone will recognize from many other contexts around the world. There's all kinds of focus on you know, bonding with the baby right a after it's born, the importance of skin-to-skin -skin contact, the importance of, of hugs and those kinds of positive touch for children, especially from parents. But um, I was really interested as I was doing my research to see sort of how it was formalized and how it was sort of, we became sort of a part of the education curriculum in a way to have these kind of sensory development programs or five senses programs. And so um, in addition to these specific um, sensory programs, there were also all kinds of new developments in preschool education that I was noticing um, and that have continued until today focuses on um, sort of the forest preschools, making sure kids get out of the classroom and directly touch leaves and dirt and those kind of things, things you can't do so easily when you live in an apartment in a large city in Korea. And so just a lot of focus in discussions on child rearing on touch and especially the power of the mother's touch in raising a kid who's going to be well adjusted and whose brain is literally going to grow in order to become a, a smart child but who also needs the touch to become psychologically whole and so I, yeah as I was noticing this I started attending one of these five census development classes and it was it was very interesting to me The program of the class was pretty much identical each week. There was a focus on singing, like in a very um, certain kind of volume and certain kind of speed, scientifically proven ways to, to influence babies' brain waves and, and brain development. And then when I was writing about this, I focused on touch, but then I, I was also noticing that basically the senses have just become a really important area where mothers feel like that's something that they can do as mothers in order to raise healthy children. But then, as I argue in my work, it also becomes a fraught and difficult thing because as soon as everybody else also starts investing in these five census development classes, then your kid might not keep up. You're giving them all these benefits, but then everyone else is investing in this as well. And so instead of just becoming this nice thing you're supposed to do with your child for bonding and for their physical and mental well-being, uh, emotional well-being, it becomes another mandatory thing to do for children. It almost becomes subsumed into the whole private education industry. You further write that the sense of touch also plays a part in the national healing. Could you tell us more about that? One other thing I thought was really interesting as I was conducting these interviews and attending these, these sensory development classes is that as I talked to women, 
they would say things like, of course, I'm doing this because I want my child to have all of the benefits that they can have as they're starting out in life. And they would explicitly mention the competitiveness of the Korean education system and how you really have to build in all of these benefits to your children, give them all these advantages from a very early age. And again, I don't want to say that these these kind of classes don't exist elsewhere because they do. And, you know, in the U.S. we have all kinds of children's gymnastics classes and, and you know, there's similar things that go on. But I would say that they're not quite, there's not quite the, the number of them and they don't seem to have quite the popularity that they do in Korea at the moment. Um, and they're also not quite as formalized, I would argue. But as I was talking to women, um, they would say, of course, this is something I can do for my child. It's not great insurance, it might not work, but it's some kind of insurance I can kind of uh, invest in now and so so that my child will have an advantage as they go through elementary school or possibly later on too. But they did actually, they would extend that and say, um, if if we all invest in our children in this way, our children will become more psychologically stable, they'll have more emotional resilience. Um, And then that'll be a good thing for the nation as well. And so I really identified this, the way women talked about this, they would actually bring this up in the context of the low birth rate. Uh, As you know, Korea has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. It's it's always Japan and Korea and Taiwan, I think, that are vying for, for number one in terms of having the fewest number of children. And so they would bring this up in the context of that birth rate crisis that they're hearing over and over again, um, sort of an injunction for them to have more children for national strength. And so they would turn around this idea of national strength and say, more than national strength in terms of population quantity, we need to have national resilience or sort of national healing on a large scale for population quality. So they would focus on these things one can do with their children as a way to heal the nation. And I was interpreting the healing they were talking about as actually healing these children and then these adults that have been damaged by the education system. Um, Because the education system and its stress and its competitiveness is something that was really on the minds of all the women I was interviewing, whether their kids were high school age or preschool age or some of them already university age. Aren't the mother's attempt to subvert the national narratives on education and maternity themselves being subverted by those neoliberal ideals of now it's no longer optional to give five cents education to your children. It's one more step. And this idea of competition that is omnipresent in Korea. Yes, I think you're exactly right. I think um, that's something that I was I was noticing a lot as I was working through the material is that even the women themselves would say this is something that um, we need to do um, sort of another area we can focus on. We could focus on the senses and, and you know, we're not going to send our three-year-old to sort of intensive English classes. We're going to hold off on the intensive English or violin or something like that and just focus on really this bonding time between mothers and children, running and jumping and and baby massage. There was a lot of focus on baby massage or toddler massage. And so we're going to focus on these more sort of gentle, positive sort of sensory areas as a way of kind of holding off on all these other stressful things that are such controversial topics in Korea. When to start uh, English education, um, when to start music lessons or taekwondo or any of those other kinds of things that you're supposed to send your kid to. But then even the women themselves would start to identify as they were speaking that um, you know every, now there's so many of these classes it kind of seems like everyone is sending their kid to these classes. It's like it becomes another requirement for me as a mother to then to take my child or take my baby at a very young age to these kind of classes. Another thing to fill your schedule with. And I mean a lot of the women I should say they weren't not just t- going to these classes just for their children they were also going to these classes as their own kind of self-development and many of them saw that as a really positive thing too. They were able to meet other mothers, they were talking to other mothers. These are new mothers with with little babies and it's quite a stressful time in a lot of people's life when you have a new baby you don't know what to do with. (laughs) So there were these positive aspects to the sensory development classes but then there was already some stress creeping in to the women's voices saying this is just kind of another thing. And also, I mean, the class dimensions of this become really apparent too. It's that we can build resilient children, we can make these children um, more psychologically whole from a young age if we send them to these kind of classes, but these are all sort of, uh, the price ranged from sort of quite expensive to not very expensive, depending on whether it was the apartment store class or the community center class, how many times a week it was, what kind of credentials the, the instructors had, but still it was kind of something you had to bring your kids to and pay for. So there was also that class element that it's kind of only the middle class 
and only the mothers who are staying home with children and not working that have time to bring children to these kind of classes. So uh, then the question becomes, well, I guess two questions come up. How how much is this really breaking Korea out of any kind of the sort of neoliberal education track in which you must always build more value into yourself and always pursue sort of your own human capital trajectory? And the other question becomes, um, for who is this? Is there any potential for those outside of the middle class, for working class people to also to do these kind of um, psychological value building or uh, emotional resilience training for their children? Moving on to school age parenting, you discuss sound and music as, and I quote, constellations of hope and possible futures for children and teenage youth. Could you tell us more about that? Sure. When I was doing my research, as I said, I had some interviewees that were in their 30s that tended to have younger children, and then the interviewees in their 50s. Some of them, are, I guess they were around 50, not much older than that. Um, some of them had children in sort of late high school, early university years. But the women I talked to especially who were in their 40s had children in middle school, um, late elementary school, early middle school, some going into high school. And so something they talked a lot about was the conflicts or the difficulties they had with their children over pop culture obsessions. And so this is another thing, in addition to TV dramas, there's been, of course, a lot of attention recently to K-pop, people focusing on K-pop fans overseas. Um, but I was interested here in how K-pop is being dealt with within the family. So how, if it, you know, in some cases, of course, it's not an issue, but if a, if a child becomes sort of a, a K-pop fan to an extreme degree and wants to go to all the concerts and wants to get all of the albums or only listens to music and doesn't study, then that becomes a problem. So um, I was interviewing some women who talked about all of the hope that their children, especially teenage daughters, all of the hope that their daughters had in K-pop, um, even though the hope, it was kind of hard to pin down what exactly they were getting from K-pop, aside from just kind of an escape from studying. But the mothers were really trying to understand the ways in which K-pop actually could be useful and valuable, and actually even in some cases profitable for their children. Because now um, there's been some research on this, especially a researcher named named Sui Lin Ho has worked on these K-pop academies that have popped up around Seoul and then in other cities as well. And then in Jeonju, you don't just have the K-pop academies, you have all kinds of traditional dance hagwon popping up too, because it's a bit more of a traditional culture city. So some of the people I interviewed had children going to these traditional dance academies, kind of as an alternative to academic hagwon. And then the hope was that they could learn some pop dance and some traditional dance, and then they could actually make some kind of career or some kind of, at least some kind of satisfying hobby out of that. And so I was looking um, in this section of my work on the ways that mothers and daughters uh, discussed K-pop and discussed music and sort of sound as a diversion. Basically, as I was tracing what mothers said about their daughters' obsessions with K-pop, uh, many of them focused on the potential that fandom could have for their daughters. Because in Korea, um, if we look at fandom as sort of a category of activity. Of course, there's been fans, there's been pop music in Korea for a long time. There's, If you look at TV drama fandom, there's been TV dramas in Korea for a long time too. So, you know, the women that I was interviewing were also probably fans of a TV show or of a singer when they were younger too. But the whole K-pop as sort of a category is quite a new thing. Um, really, um, some of the dramas recently, um, the whole Answer Me 1997, in that drama, um, it dealt with the emergence of fandom um, as sort of K-pop fandom as a new thing um, in the late 1990s with with bands like H.O.T. and, and these kinds of um, Soteji and these kinds of um, new Korean pop acts. And so um, even though women themselves were fans of things throughout their life um, and had these kind of emotional investments in pop music or pop culture, um, having their children engage with K-pop is kind of a new thing. And so uh, many of them that I talked to were t trying to grapple with the idea of their, ch of their daughter's fandom as being a potential Career is kind of too strong a word, but just a potential source of, of hope, really, a, a potential source of usefulness or sort of a way for their daughters to sort of make a place for themselves. And some of them actually would speak in terms of career, that if their daughters were really getting involved in certain kinds of website design or sort of the idea of, of blogging as a potential for, for income and satisfaction, some of them went that far, but then others just thought, you know, just the very practice of fandom for their daughters, um, especially daughters who are not particularly academically inclined, 
and who also were not particularly musically inclined or creatively inclined. So these were not girls who would become Seoul National University students, and they also weren't girls who would become the next backup dancer for whichever K-pop group. So trying to think about the ways that fandom, um, while kind of anxiety-producing for mothers, could actually be a positive influence on daughters' lives. In your research, you discuss three possible futures for children. As you just mentioned, the fan, the creative pop idol, and the academic all-star. Well, while the first two are clearly linked to sound and music, how is that the case for the academic all-star? In this chapter, I was basing what I was writing off of these interviews with the mothers themselves and also, um, to a lesser extent, with their daughters. Uh, I was also looking at a drama that was very popular at this time, which was the drama Kombuation, God of Study. And so a lot of them, when I was interviewing, they said they were watching the dramas with their daughters. And it was a drama that they could enjoy with their daughters and sons, daughters and sons both. And then um, it was a drama that I don't know how many people have heard about it or, um, or seen it, but the whole point of the show, it was just sort of a standard high school drama about a group of kids who are not very good academically, who then a teacher takes them under his wing and they become top students and they're trying to get into to Seoul National University. They don't call it Seoul National University on the show, but that's the implication. And so amidst just sort of the normal drama stuff going on, there's also all of these study tips that pop up, things that you can actually use as a parent or as a, as a student to improve your study skills and to get a higher score on the university entrance exam. I was um, talking about this drama and talking about the whole idea of academic success with these women. And, you know, academic success in the past in Korea was was seen as just um, just sort of a unconditionally positive thing, that if you became a good student and then continued moving up in the world and got into Yonsei or got into Seoul National or possibly some other universities too, if you became a prosecutor or a doctor, a lawyer, if you, if you kind of went all the way up with these academic skills, then you would have a good life. You'd be set for life. You could support your family, both your your family and then your um, you could support your children and also support your parents as they got older in life. But now I think, I mean, since the financial crisis in 97 in Korea, there's not that sense as much anymore of having a path just all set out for you, even if you follow all of these rules and even if you are the top of the crop academically. The whole idea of the academic all-star is, is seen with more and more suspicion and that there's a worry that basically, at least for the people I was interviewing, a worry that you could kind of go all the way through, get into a great university, graduate top of your class, take up one of these positions, and then you could be so burnt out at that point that your life wouldn't have meaning. So there was a lot of, you know, I think very normal and healthy questioning of the whole industry of education and the whole enterprise of academic success. So there was um, discussion among the women and things expressed in the interviews about whether this was really a good route and whether maybe some kind of creative pursuit could be safer in terms of protecting uh, a child's psychological well-being. So this goes back to the last section of the dissertation too, um, looking at early childhood psychological well-being, but then thinking about sound and music as something that could really protect a, a teenager's psychological well-being. And so um, a lot more suspicion of the educational system and a lot more worries about the ultimate payoff of that and more, more investment in the idea of K-pop, even though there's still a lot of concerns about how that will play out too. Uh, for the women who were sending their kids to K-pop Hagwon or thinking of it, of course, most of them didn't have the illusion that their kid would become the next great singer or boy band or girl band member. But still, I mean, it's kind of amazing that many of them actually thought that it was a safer bet than having their kid go through to become a, a Seoul National University student. Basically, the whole idea of academic success was really questioned for the woman I was interviewing. You mentioned that fans were normally girls. Are the two other paths, which are creativity and academia, also gendered? And where do boys fit uh, in all that? That's a good question. I, in general, definitely the, the whole discussion of fans was very gendered. It was very um, focused on, on girls and on um, teenage girls and how fandom was becoming more of an appropriate thing for them to do, seen as a healthy kind of outlet and possibly even more than that. 
but Teenage Sun's fandom was not seen as positively. Definitely things like sports could kind of take the place of fandom um, if they were following sports or doing some kind of sports. But, you know, Korea, um, I think many have noticed that in Korea, you don't just do a little bit of sports usually. It's like you, you kind of you study or you kind of opt out of the, the, the whole academic system and, and train for in some kind of sports. So it's hard to just do a little bit of baseball or a little bit of basketball on the side. So um, definitely the discussion of fandom was mostly centered on teenage girls. In terms of creative pursuits, I guess, I saw mothers as talking about a possibility for both boys and girls, but still especially girls. There was this idea that if girls studied traditional dance and then maybe pop dance as well, basically it would be possibly a safer bet for them in terms of even getting into university, getting into a dance department. Um, It wasn't talked about as such an ideal thing for boys to do. So there was still sort of um, academics um, and sort of going the traditional path of studying was still the main thing that mothers I talked to expected their boys to do. But I think a little more flexibility introduced for both genders and some acceptance of the fan pursuits of boys as well. As teens become young adults, you move from sound and focus on the sense of taste. And you discuss three possible understanding of taste. The barista, the baker, and the traditional liquor distiller. First of all, why shift uh, in terms of sense? One reason that I shifted in talking about the way that the woman I talked to framed their difficulties navigating their children's trajectory and, and, and dealing with these kind of family issues involving children, the reason I shifted from sound to taste is that generally the women I talked to didn't really expect that their children, once they became university students or graduated from university, that they would still be fans or that they would still sort of have this um, teenage obsession with K-pop or other kinds of, of music. And so as I looked around me, especially especially down in Jeonju, which is not a city with a lot of industry. Um, It's changing a little bit, I think, in the last few years. Um, But it's a city that's known, of course, for traditional foods and other kinds of traditional culture. And so looking around me, so many of the young adults, even university graduates, were working as barista in cafes or they were working in restaurants. And so this was not really seen as ideal. I don't think it's seen as ideal um, in a lot of Korea that if you finish university, then you'll be in food service, basically. But um, it is the reality that there's not enough of these ideal company jobs to go around. So many people in university or just out of university are working in these kinds of jobs. So the discussion of taste and sort of the development of Korean tastes or global tastes or the sort of the possibility of taste for having a sort of hopeful future in Korea or outside of Korea was something women talked about in the context of 20-somethings especially, that they were talking about their children or their, their children in the future once they did go to university and were out in the world. They talked about how their children would have this sort of global taste that they themselves didn't possess, even if they did go to all kinds of um, Western restaurants or consider themselves quite cosmopolitan. They talked about their children as being able to bridge these two different worlds, sort of the traditional Korean palate or Korean taste and then global taste as well. And so Koreans at, of this age, 20-somethings, were seen, by at least by my interviewees, uh, and I was also picking up on a lot of media discussions of Korean taste and global tastes and sort of youth as the bearers of, of these kinds of tastes. Basically, they're seen as the most it's, it's the most possible age or it's the most um, ideal age at which to sort of further a, a global Korean taste, if you will. So uh, that's why I focused on, on taste in that part of my work. And so I, I looked, again, I, I think in all of, all of my chapters except maybe the one on touch, I also integrated particular dramas that the women were talking about. So again, not all of my interviews were, were watching the dramas, but many of them did. And so um, I was actually in, in that chapter, I was talking about the barista that is, has come up in a lot of different Korean dramas as sort of a, a romantic figure. And then I was looking at baking in one drama, um, in the very popular drama from a couple years back. Um, the King of Baking, Kim Taku was the drama. And then also looking at the sort of Makwali distiller, that kind of traditional Korean liquor worker that has come up in dramas recently too. So looking at dramas as a way of understanding how this kind of youth career possibility is understood, and then also talking with the women themselves about how they see taste as a, a possible future for Korean youth. So what about the barista, baker, and liquor distiller? Could you tell us more about those three types? What do they embody in your research? So as I was writing through these different kinds of youth workers, 
basically the, the people working in liquor distilling. I was looking at the drama Cinderella Sister, but uh, there's been other dramas as well about especially youth working with Korean traditional spirits. So um, there was one drama, I forget the name right now, that it was kind of like a, ro- a romance between a sommelier of you know Western wine and then the, the woman was working with making new and unique Korean makgeolli types. Um, And so basically the barista is sort of the way it's circulated in dramas, and then there's been some research by other scholars on the meaning of coffee in Korea. It's sort of uh, definitely seen as kind of a Western pursuit. Um, You can think about um, in the 90s, a lot of transnational coffee chains entering Korea and transforming Korea from a country that drank instant coffee to a country that drank wandu coffee, the whole bean coffee. Um, And so there was this um, focus on globalized Korean taste through uh, Western cafes. And then many have incorporated, of course, a lot of Korean taste too, um, or sort of somewhat Korean taste, like sweet potato lattes and um, green tea lattes and sort of indigenize their menus a little bit too. But you have the barista sort of representing this cosmopolitan citizenship. And then you have baking. Um, actually, I was analyzing it as it appeared in the drama, um, King of Baking, Kim Taku, as being a very national pursuit. Because in the drama, the main character is taking over his father's business. There's a whole sort of side story, or I guess it's, it's not a side story, but convoluted story anyway about him being an orphan. And, you know, it's a very over-the-top drama. But anyway, he's inheriting his father's or taking over the family's business, um, working in a bread factory. So it's not just this sort of artisanal notion of bread making. It's a sort of industrial idea of bread making. And so thinking back to Korea's industrialization and these mass-produced bread companies, the packages you still find in convenience stores, of bread as sort of a a national kind of thing. This a thing that is somewhat, uh, it does have Western connections, of course, but it's sort of this thing you can mass produce and that will kind of keep people satisfied and full. And so then you have um, the third figure I talk about is the makgeolli maker or the youth that works with traditional Korean uh, wines or liquors and how in the dramas, usually it's a she who somehow represents Korean tradition, sort of in the way that she develops these traditional Korean things, makgeolli or I guess soju in some cases, develops them to, to appeal to a Western market. So there's a lot of, and I think all of these dramas I've seen in which the young people are dealing with making these traditional alcoholic drinks. Uh, They're trying to promote them abroad and um, trying to make a Korean thing into a global thing, basically. So for the barista and for coffee, you have a global thing, which kind of becomes a Korean thing. And then bread is sort of this kind of national thing, but not really. And then for makgeolli, you have a Korean thing, which is then trying to become a global thing. So you have all of these different kinds of, of drinks and food sort of representing global Korean cuisine. And so that's something that women I talked to in my research discussed as as something hopeful for unemployed or underemployed Korean youth, that um, being able to bridge all of these different tastes will give them the possibility to be successful in the global economy and sort of in this uh, new creative knowledge-based economy. What about mothers? How do they perceive these three different um, paths? Again, since I was not in Seoul and I was down in the southwest, this is a place where there's sort of a, a whole culture around the whole makgeolli jip and um, a lot of locally produced makgeolli, especially in recent years. And so I think in that city, women who were raising kids that were teenagers or were university age saw going into traditional food as being a really positive thing. Definitely it could be better if you were wanting sort of long-term financial success for your family, for your kid to go to Samsung or something. But definitely going into traditional foods, whether opening a restaurant or being involved in sort of Ministry of Tourism, um, sort of that kind of promotion of global Korean cuisine was seen as a really positive thing down there. And I think it's not just true there, but I think it was especially true there. But then, I mean, for the baristas, that was there was all these cafes popping up, and um, especially the years that I was doing field work, which was from 2010 to 2012. Still, still plenty of cafes popping up now, but I guess there's been some concerns that there's quite an oversaturation of cafes and a lot of them failing at the moment too. But definitely the, the barista, um, there was still a lot of connection with baristas with sort of the old um, tabang kind of employment, um, which was not seen as a favorable thing. Working in a tabang is kind of a shady thing. Um, tabang being sort of the, the thing you had before cafes where you would serve instant coffee and also drinks and sort of a lot of perhaps unsavoring sort of sexual transactions would go on as well. And so there is still some connection with cafes with tabang, I think, for some especially older women. 
But more than that, I think cafes were still seen as quite risky, that some of them could be a long-standing cafe in the community, but many of them could also fold pretty quickly. But nonetheless, there were a lot of um, cafe hagwam popping up, um, and it wasn't just the young people in the city that were attending to learn how to get their coffee certificate and become a certified barista, but a lot of women um, who had had children and, and their children were now university age were actually competing with people their children's age to become a, a sort of master barista in a cafe, to open their own cafe. Um, and so there was that interesting kind of competition um, in a city like Jeonju between women who were trying to go back into the labor force and then their children who were just trying to start out in the labor force and, and um, going into food instead of um, the more difficult company life too. Two words you mention are sonmet and immet. What do these words mean and how do they relate to what you just said? Immat and sonmet, they're both ways to say taste. But I mean, imad is, much, is used much more in the sense of like a, a person's personal taste. And so these words came up a lot when I was talking with women about possibilities um, for their children. And I mean, I should say off, I was mostly interviewing women, but then often their children were are kind of hanging around as well. So I also interviewed their children to a lesser extent. And so imma, sort of the ability to have taste and express taste and sort of translate taste was seen as something that youth um, were in a really good position to do that they would be able to bridge um, global tastes and Korean tastes. And the immat was something that they really were in a great position to hold. Whereas sonmat, I mean, it literally means hand taste. And so this is used, you'll see it, um, you'll see restaurants that are called like mom's hand taste. Or um, it's a word you see quite often applied, especially to Korean cuisine. Not so much like a burger joint, um, although I guess there's mom's touch burgers. Anyway. But you see it applied more often to Korean food. And so it's something that, especially the way it was talked about, it was that women who had sort of put in their years cooking at home and developing their own cooking styles and sort of learning the different tastes of their family members and satisfying all family members, and they, they were the ones that could bear this sonmat. Whereas if you were 20, 22, and just finished university, you might have a, a really great sort of sense of taste in the immat kind of sense, but you didn't really have the ability to yet convey any kind of sonmat. So um, this was something that women who were re-entering the labor force were saying about their own superior qualities, that they'd be the one that would be able to more effectively run a Korean restaurant, but that they might employ people that were their children's age to really, um, if they wanted to have more of a fusion kind of sensibility for their restaurant, or to have a younger person that could then really understand global tastes and understand how even Koreans are now wanting more fusion elements or sort of global elements to their food. But then sonmat too is something that um, people talked about. Even if you might not develop it fully until you put in a lot of time, it's definitely something that then can be passed on from generation to generation. So I think that's why you see there's there's a lot of dramas recently or cooking shows too that focus on passing on traditional Korean cuisine knowledge to younger generations because it's something that we shouldn't that Koreans shouldn't lose and that um, women of a certain age are uniquely positioned to to pass on. To conclude. Are you seeing any specific development between what you research and either new generations of young mother in their 20s or thir early 30s, or any general new foreseeable trend in the future? I guess my field work uh, for this project finished in 2012, and I've been working on um, transforming the dissertation into a book. And I haven't gone and done the same kind of intensive interviews that I did back then, but I've definitely been following media discussions of family, as well as sort of just media reports on social issues in general. And uh, one thing that I've seen popping up a lot is kind of linked to something I mentioned earlier, um, the issue of children's sensory development, the issue of um, things like forest preschools and getting out of the city and getting into nature. So some of the people I, I talked to back in 2010 to 2012 uh, really strongly expressed a desire to leave the city. So even though they were down in Jeonju, which is not as densely populated as Seoul by any means, they still wanted to say goodbye to city life. And so uh, I've talked to a lot more people recently that um, they might not really feel like they can leave the city. Um, jobs are here, education, certain kinds of education that they think that their children need are in the cities. But many more of them seem to be considering the possibility or considering some future possibility of getting out of cities. And so for the mothers I talk to, they identify going back to the countryside as something they can do for their children's emotional health 
psychological health and in some cases physical health. There's been a lot of discussions about children's allergies, increasing um, skin conditions, other kinds of food allergies that are linked to air and water pollution. And so definitely this movement from the city to the country is something that I see kind of slowly starting. So if that actually becomes a movement with significant numbers and not just older people moving back to the countryside, which has been happening for some time, but actually younger people. So we, we see younger people in their 20s moving to places like Jeju-do to try to live outside of cities. Um, and try kind of some kinds of new alternative livelihoods. And then you see older people that are sick of life in the cities and are moving back. People who, are, who have retired, maybe they retired young, but they're in their, their 50s or early 60s. They're moving back to the countryside. When I say back, I don't even necessarily mean that they ever lived there, but back to, to what their parents might have been doing or their grandparents and doing things like farming. But I'm really interested in how people with children, with young children, are more and more thinking of escaping city life and are doing it for reasons that they see as being linked to sensory issues, that they want their family to be, at a sensory level, more healthy because of moving back, uh, moving outside of cities. I guess the other thing I can say, um, definitely, I mean, since I finished my field work, the whole Sewol thinking happened as well. And so a lot of discussion circulating about how to protect our youth, what can Korea do as a nation to hold the government accountable and to protect Korea's youth because so many of those who died were the high school students. And so um, definitely in watching the protests that unfolded and that still go on in, in little bits and pieces today, I was really interested in the way affect circulated throughout the crowd. And so all of these different, different ways of voicing grief and different ways of expressing grief even through touch in terms of the ways protesters organize spatially. Um, I was really interested in, in those kind of sensory aspects of protest. And so, uh, of course, it's a terribly sad event that doesn't really have closure yet. But I'll, I'll be curious to see how, as people talk more and more about the need for some, something outside of industrial development and sort of this, this never-ending competition, how much the sensory becomes a part of people's calculations. Professor Tilland, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to speak. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.